Welcome to the I Now Pronounce You Divorced podcast, where we have three award-winning family law attorneys dive into intriguing topics like divorce, military divorce, custody and visitation, trust and estate planning, and all things family law. Join us as we provide a comprehensive viewpoint through the eyes of our experts and guests aiming to educate and soothe our listeners. Get ready to tune in because I Now Pronounce You Divorced starts right now. Hi, I'm Charles Hatley with Lone Hatley PC, where we truly are your partner in the divorce and estate planning process. This is our podcast, I Now Pronounce You Divorce, where each week we come together and we talk about issues that go along in family law or estate planning that we think would be helpful for your case. Today, I'm joined by Peter Bradshaw. He recently opened our brand new Tampa, Florida office. And what we wanted to discuss first is allow him to introduce himself and second, discuss how do you get a divorce in Florida? You know, is it different? Is it, is it something I need to be aware of? So first of all, Peter, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, uh, I'm Peter Bradshaw, obviously. Uh, I grew up actually in the Virginia area and moved down to Florida to go to law school. Uh, and I've been working here in law for about the last 11 years at this point. Um, spent five as a public defender and then uh, five with legal aid. Uh, and then I'm now doing uh, family law here. Uh, and it's been a good experience overall and uh, happy to be here and uh, looking forward to opening this office and uh, bringing clients in and helping them and really pushing forward the Malone Hatley uh, process and like the theory that we have of uh, dealing with divorces and you know, family law issues. And, you know, you brought up your past in the public defender, Alina, you know, divorce and criminal law, unfortunately go hand to hand quite frequently, don't they? Yeah, so I spent a year just doing domestic violence cases in Pinellas County. Um, and so we saw a lot of those issues kind of creeping into each other, um, and especially when it comes to domestic violence issues. Uh, and one of the reasons I moved to legal aid is because the grant that I was working on was specifically for victims of domestic violence and assisting them with getting dissolution of marriage, paternity cases, and even injunctions. And unfortunately, and I say this unfortunately, a lot of the dissolutions of marriages do start with domestic violence issues. What are the other ways a dissolution of marriage can start? So in Florida, it's a lot different than most other states. So, so I've had the opportunity to kind of sit in some meetings and kind of watch the Virginia and North Carolina processes. And it's substantially different here in Florida. In Florida, really only one party needs to believe that the marriage and the key term here is irretrievably broken. If one person believes the marriage is irretrievably broken, that's that's it. That's all you need. You don't need somebody to sign off on it. You don't need somebody else to sign the paperwork. And that's a common misconception for a lot of people. Okay. So you don't need to have this before I can start the divorce process. We have to agree on a, a legal separation. Nope. Not in Florida. You could even be living together at the same time and start your dissolution process. That being said, oh. it's recommended that that not be the case because those dissolutions can be very contentious. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there so you, you talk about a, a contentious dissolution? What are some of, of the most contentious points that you've seen in, in the dissolution of marriage? There's usually three major areas, and those are your children, uh, your equitable distribution, meaning you know what are we going to do with the money and the debts from the marriage, uh, and then uh, alimony is more of a small issue nowadays, but I would say the biggest one has been children. I mean, they're the most important things for most people uh, when it comes to dissolution. How are you guys going to work things out? How are you going to parent together? Uh, and a lot of the times the issues that cause the dissolution of marriage also kind of bleed into uh, how you guys parent. It, it absolutely does. And when you're going through the divorce process there, is it one overarching complaint for divorce or filing for divorce where you cover equitable distribution, um, alimony, and custody visitation? Or is there multiple documents that you need to file? So usually the whole process starts with somebody filing what's called a petition for dissolution of marriage. And that petition basically lays out all the things that a person wants out of the dissolution of marriage, lays out that the court has jurisdiction or basically the power to enter uh, a judgment in the case. Mm -hmm. and then. There may be some other issues that are in there, like, uh, you know, a house or something like that. Um, and really, the more complicated your finances are and the more complicated uh, your children issues are, then the more likely you're going to want to look into having an attorney. Make sure at least at a bare minimum that they look over your petition and make sure you're asking for everything so that you can get it. Because 
Florida courts have been very clear about this. If you don't ask for it in your petition, you can't get it later on. And, and that's a great point. You know, so much of what a lot of people are talking about is access to justice, right? Can you go to the court? Can you file something on your own? And the answer is generally yes, but should you? And, and that's the, the question you sort of answered is, if you have a lot going on and you forget to put in your, dis, your request for dissolution to divide a retirement account, you know, let's say you were the lower earning spouse and the other spouse has a million dollars in retirement and you forget to ask, what happens? So Florida is amazing because, and Hillsborough and Pinellas counties are both great about this. They have standardized forms and Florida okay. actually has standardized forms for that stuff. And you really only need to make a general claim for it. But the problem comes in all the discovery and the finances that get disclosed between the parties, because what happens is even though you've made this request for equitable distribution, you may not see something that an attorney might actually see in it. And that's the big issue that comes after you filed your petition for dissolution of marriage. Mm -hmm. Usually filing's pretty easy, but the problem comes, let's say you've got a house. Did you properly request that the house be divided up? Um, and that's a, that can be a very specific process. And in Florida, the courts have actually have a split still at this point of if you don't plead for a petition of the house, meaning the court forces a sale or forces mm -hmm. you know some division of that, um, then you may not be eligible to have the house sold. And so you're kind of stuck in this weird amorphous place where both of you are still, both parties are still on the house. And mm -hmm. that's not good for anybody. No, it, it is, and it ends up costing more money to go back and fix it. Um, that, that's yeah, for sure. and in having to go back in front of the court to get something modified to to reamend your petition, um, you either have to have leave from the court or leave from opposing counsel. Uh, most attorneys are pretty good about that, um, especially here in Hillsborough County. Uh, the attorneys are very reasonable overall. Um, but sometimes you get into those situations where they're not because they feel like they may have you trapped there or caught. Uh, and so they may try and force you into going in front of the judge in order to get your amendment, which is never a good thing because it just spends more time and money. And it, it does. And you never know what kind of mood the judge is going to be in that day. Uh. Well, and the big thing I find is that with clients overall, um, the reason you get an attorney is because you've got stuff going on in life. You've got mm -hmm. all these other mental things that are happening. You know, just the daily acts of, you know, going to work and dealing with traffic and all these other things. And it's really nice to have somebody there who's like on top of your case, making sure it's moving forward and handling all the intricacies that go along with your case so that you have the peace of mind that you're going to get a fair and reasonable outcome as well as, you know, you can just focus on doing the things that you need to do, especially, you know, and I'm a big kid person, you know, they're, they're one of the biggest things that I'm concerned about in the dissolution of marriage. Um, and it allows you to focus on them rather than you having to focus on all the legal issues that come along with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so now, you know, if you filed your dissolution uh, uh, for marriage, what happens next? So once a person files, uh, they, that starts the process. Mm -hmm. um, parties have to do some exchanging of documents. Uh, there's two major financial things that have to get exchanged. Um, the first is a financial affidavit, and that's basically a summary of somebody's finances. And the second is a certificate of compliance with mandatory disclosure. And basically, that's just a fancy way of saying checklist of financial documents. One of the things that comes up pretty often is that parties will sometimes try and file their actual finances with the court. And that's not a good thing because we don't want your bank records and things like that to be public record. Mm -hmm. And so unless you have an attorney that can tell you, hey, you actually just gave these to their counsel or the other party, um, and maybe you want to redact stuff, you know, that's really what counsel would be there for. Um, but once all of that paperwork is done, then you go to your first court date here in Florida, and that's basically a case management conference. It's mm -hmm. basically a meeting between the parties, the judge, uh, their attorneys, if they've got them, and court says, okay, where are we at with this case? And in Hillsborough County, we've actually done, we actually take what's called initial jurisdiction testimony. So the court wants to make sure early in the process that it has the power to enter an order. Uh, and so right after that case management, the court will usually then order the parties to attend mediation. And, 
you, you spoke quickly about jurisdiction. I, I know that, that Florida is ripe for people moving there after they retire or people moving into the ju jurisdiction. What is the jurisdictional requirement? So Florida requires that a party be within the state of Florida for at least six months prior to the filing of the dissolution of marriage. Um, and there are some other intricacies that are probably beyond the scope of today, but that's kind of the general rule that you have to follow. Uh, a lot of times what the courts will do is they will look at the issue date on a party's driver's license. And as long as that's at least six months before the filing of a petition, that's usually sufficient to give the court jurisdiction. Hmm. And I know, you know, we throughout our organization deal with a lot of military and, you know, with military, you may not want to change your driver's license. But in that particular instance, you can show your workers, right? You know, they, they usually get something that's signed that says this is the day you're going to be there. Is that correct? Yeah, so even if a party doesn't have their driver's license within that six months or within that period of time, um, if you have actually been a resident of Florida, you can do an affidavit uh, signed by another party that guarantees you've been there for at least the last six months. So that's another option. But, you know, we, those are always the caveats and things that are you know, intricacies that you would only know if you've, you know, done these cases quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and you brought up alimony uh, relatively quick. So what if you file your dissolution for divorce and you're the lower earning spouse? Is there any mechanism in Florida where you can go to the court before the final order of divorce and say, look, I need some sort of support. I need somebody to pay for my, my rent. I need to make sure my health insurance stays active. Is there anything like that? Yes. Okay. And I say yes with like a little asterisk beside it, like Barry Bonds hitting home runs here. Um, there are methods of getting, you know, attorney's fees and things like that kind of paid for. The biggest issues that come up are need and ability to pay with mm -hmm. those things. Um, and so a lot of times the courts are pretty hesitant to do things until the parties have had an opportunity to mediate the case. And mediation can take a little while. Uh, depending on who you use, how you do it. Um, and so the answer is yes, there are methods for doing that, but generally the courts want the parties to attend mediation prior to any temporary relief issues. Uh, and so that becomes a bit of an, a problem for me as an attorney because you've got people who you know, may be victims of financial abuse mm -hmm. where the other party pulls all the money out of the bank accounts and they're not what we call dissipating the asset, meaning like spending it on like a new relationship or something like that, but they're just using it in the normal course of their daily life, leaving the other party kind of stuck. Um, and so that can be a bit of an issue. And so having counsel to kind of work you through those problems and those intricacies is pretty helpful um, in my experience. And you, know, you talk about mediation. Is mediation required before you go to a divorce trial? Yes. In okay. Florida, the, the rule has been that you have to go to mediation within six months. Mm -hmm. um, and different courts have uh, some different rules on that. Um, but the state, there's a, actually, a, when you file in Hillsborough County, there is a standing temporary order in family law cases. And that order actually has in it that it wants you to go to mediation prior to that time. And how long does a divorce generally take from the, the date you file your dissolution uh, of marriage? Let's say you, you're doing everything timely, you go to mediation, mediation doesn't work, and you have to go to trial. How long does that usually take? Um, the answer is always the classic attorney answer. It depends. Uh, but you could probably get there if it's an actual trial within about six months. Okay. Okay. Biggest issue has been the court's dockets mm -hmm. um, and how many cases the court has. Um, because finding time for a full day hearing is a lot harder than getting something that's like maybe two, three hours. So depending on how intricate your case is and what needs to be proved, uh, that can change, uh, you know, how quick it can happen. You know, if it's something where you guys have an agreement and you just want to, you know, you guys have everything dealt with at mediation, those go a lot faster. Um, that doesn't mean people should give up their rights and, you know, say, you know, I'm not going to take what I'm entitled to. It's just to say, like, if you want to go to trial, it does take time in order to get to the, you know, to the bench and to get in the courtroom. 
It, it does. And, you know, that that's every jurisdiction we practice in is, you know, part of the divorce process has been calculating how much time it's going to take from the date we file to the date we're going to get a, a final divorce. And you, you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, don't agree to something just because you don't want to wait those extra few months. If you agree something in a property settlement agreement or a separation agreement and you sign it, how easy is it to go get that undone? It's extremely difficult to get it undone uh, because the courts want the parties to come to an agreement to deal with their issues because the general belief is that parties know better than the court on how to resolve their issues. That being said, when it comes to having children, the court still needs to have some kind of hearing to mm. determine that the agreement is in the best interest of the minor children. Because if they don't, then it's reversible error uh, for the court to just merely sign a parenting plan off without making sure or making a finding that that parenting plan is in the best interest of the minor children. Mm. Yeah, it, it's tough. You know, when I'm going through, you know, it, I always tell people, if you can't wait, let's work on a, a temporary order or a temporary agreement. Do you guys ever sign temporary agreements and say, look, this is just how it's going to work until we get to a full argument on this? So that's really a strategy decision that comes down to the individual client. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes if you've got somebody who says, well, uh, dad doesn't really deal with the children, but he's asking for 50-50 time sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I notice I'm not using the word custody here because Florida kind of got rid of that term custody. Okay. Um, so maybe the dad's out, you're, you're the, the other parents asking for 50% of the children's time. Mm -hmm. um, and I get a client that says, well, he doesn't do anything with the kids anyways. I might go ahead and say, let's do a 50-50 agreement in the meantime, because mm -hmm. that temporary agreement can lay the foundation for a strong case later on, because he's had the agreement for whatever period of time until we can get to trial. And if they don't follow it, then now you've got really good evidence to say, hey, even there, when there was this temporary agreement, he's still not doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I tell clients immediately from the date we start a case. Um, I want them to keep a good journal of mm -hmm. how exchanges go. And I want them to keep the fairest version of that. If something goes great, write it down. If something mm -hmm. goes poorly, write it down. Because later on, when you have to reference that six, nine, ten months down the road, if you can reference those specific dates, it becomes amazingly helpful in your testimony. And mm -hmm. you know, if I can go on a little diatribe for a second, give us a little war story. Um, I had a client, we were doing what's called a deposition. That's basically where they get questioned by the opposing party. Um, we were in the in their this other attorney's office. The other attorney's asking them questions, and they go, well, what deeds didn't he come see the child? Mm -hmm. And my client goes, um, I don't know off the top of my head. And the other attorney's like, well, you know, how can you be sure that he didn't do it? Well, I actually have my calendar down here. And so she reaches down in her purse, pulls out her calendar, and is able to list off and rattle off all the dates that he had or didn't show, showed up late, um, just completely ignored the child. And, um, you know, she also wrote down kind of how it affected the child as well. Mm -hmm. By the end of that deposition, I didn't have to take his deposition. We were settling that case because their side was like she had the records for it. She knew what she was talking about and the client had followed the advice that we had given her. No, that's, you know, exactly the type of advice any client should be looking for. Sometimes, you know, attorneys, we talk to clients about this is the legal ramifications of what you're going to do. This is statutory requirements, what we're going to do. Sometimes it is the real world experience of, hey, you're going to forget. This is a stressful time. You're not going to be able to pull these dates off that off the top of your head. And I know exactly what another attorney is going to do is say, well, tell me which dates. And you pull them out and you can show that perfectly. But Peter, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Next time, we're going to get, dive deeper into, you know, how to uh, fight a custody and visitation case, how to do child support, how to do alimony, how to do equitable distribution uh, in, in Florida. So if you enjoyed this, you know, subscribe to our channel. You know, we have all sorts of advice that we give, especially on Florida divorces, as Peter starts giving us more and more advice on what you should do in this process. Um, I want to thank you for taking time to listen to us. And if you or someone you know is going through the divorce process, give us a call and see the difference that a partner can make for you. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you for tuning in to our podcast. If you found this episode helpful and you want more informational content, please be sure to subscribe and join us on all major social media platforms, including YouTube. Stay connected for more exciting updates and tips.